Okay. Hello, everybody. We are uh, getting ready to go live all the time. So we're just kind of playing around tonight. Thank you for joining me, though. We're going to have a fun time. We're going to look at some great stuff. I don't know if you got notifications before because my streaming software crashed a whole bunch of times. So if you're there, uh, give me a thumbs up. Say hello. Leave a comment below i'm not sure how many people we're going to get here tonight because this is impromptu nobody was expecting this and it's already quarter past 10. uh it looks like i'm here and so that's good hey laura look there's people turning up we're going to talk about god for a while and we're going to ask a question like what do we what do we mean when we talk about god and uh let me get rid of this music actually because it's just little bit annoying so welcome everybody Ray, ray's here kathy's here good to see you kathy I haven't seen you here for a long time but i haven't been here for a long time <laughs> so um is everything working okay i think so we haven't done this for so long now let me see if this works yeah okay good all right so uh give me a thumbs up let me know you're here and uh, that'll invite a few more people in too. We're just going to spend some time here talking about God. And there you go. Thanks for the thumbs up. And let's get into it because uh, when we talk about God, what do we mean? You see, I've been saying for a long time that for most people, their idea of God is really a God of their own making. And why I say that, and it's a very common thing actually for Christians to say, to non-Christians, or you have a God of your own making. Uh, but so do you, bucko, <laughs> okay? Because you could ask every Christian on the planet, uh, and they will all give a very different answer about what God is. And so uh, that's why I say that we, we really have a God of our own making. Can you hear me okay, the audio levels? Okay, give me a thumbs up or heart uh, so that I know the audio levels are working okay. Uh, just looking down at my phone here. There you go. Awesome. So when we talk about God, what exactly do we mean? This is important because everyone seems to have their own idea about God. And six or seven, maybe it's even later than that now. Is it getting on to eight years? Um, I don't think so. About seven years. When I started with a blank slate, after spending my whole life in, in ministry, being a pastor, being a church planter, being a soul winner, talked about Jesus all my life. You never shut me up. I will always talk about Jesus. Um, and yet, as I said, when you ask a Christian what God is, if you were to have some kind of a five-minute conversation with them, you would find that every single person has a different idea about God. Now, for me, that just didn't jive. It's like if we're, we talk about God because we want the truth, right? And yet, when you've got all of these disparate and contradictory ideas about God, there's obviously a problem there because we want to make sure that we are knowing what the truth is. And so... Many years ago, when I started with a blank slate and my two questions, who are we, what is the universe, I, I just wanted to look at all the available evidence and work out, who is this God? Who's the father of Jesus? Who is Yahweh in the Old Testament? All of this stuff, everything. You want to know what is true. So I just made this mind map today that we're going to look at. Uh, I just threw it together. And we're just going to go through this, and maybe I'll turn it into a proper video and put it on YouTube later. But for now, it's just kind of us here this evening looking at God. So let me start to open this up. Um, we're going to look at two conflicting views of God. The, the general view that Christianity has of God is like this, right? It's based on a simplistic and naive Catholic tradition that we have a trinity made up of 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting how talking about the Trinity to people really can upset people, something chronic. Uh, it's become like many other uh, falsehoods, untruths in, in Christianity. It's just not in the Bible. And of course, you know, people will say uh, to me, it's all through the Bible. What are you talking about? Well, um, I've studied the Bible touch and uh, I'd, I'd invite you to show me where it is. I mean, we could look at the last verses of, of Matthew where Yeshua, Jesus says, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But you can't create uh, a doctrine, a truth about the very nature and character of God on that. But believe it or not, that is the verse that supports the Trinity in the Bible. Now, it used to be John, uh, 1 John 5, chapter 7, 1 John 5, verse 7. Um, and there uh, is where we find that the Catholics actually inserted an entire sentence into the text. And so you've got a lot of King James-only advocates today saying that all these modern translations are leaving verses out of the Bible, or removing verses from the Bible, and they'll use Jesus' parting words in his revelation to John, where it says, you know, don't you add anything or take anything away, or you're in big trouble. Uh, well, the funny thing is, modern translations are not taking away that sentence from 1 John 5, 7. They're going back to the oldest manuscripts, which don't include it. In fact, very few manuscripts include it at all, only the ones actually created by the Catholic Church. So the Catholics had to add a whole sentence into the Bible because there wasn't anything else that talked about a trinity. Now, if you've never heard that before, that might sound extraordinary. You might think, oh, you've got to be wrong. That can't be right. But it is right. The Roman Catholic Church added an entire sentence, not just a word, an entire sentence to that verse to support their invention of a trinity. But today, Protestants who are supposed to be protesting Roman Catholicism just go along with it, which is why I say you're all Catholics. If you call yourself a Christian, you're a Catholic. You say, I'm not a Catholic, I'm a Protestant, or I'm this or I'm that. Do you believe in the Trinity? Of course I believe in the Trinity. Then you're a Catholic because it's their invention. They made it up. The early church didn't talk about a trinity. Jesus didn't talk about a trinity. Yahweh doesn't talk about a trinity. None of the prophets talked about a trinity. Moses didn't talk about a trinity. The apostle Paul didn't talk about a trinity. Nowhere in the entirety of the Bible does it talk about a trinity. But people continuously tell me all the time, well, it's all through the Bible. <laughs> okay. Now, Kathy asks a good question. Why did Catholics invent a trinity? Well, it came about because of their influence from Greek philosophy. And there's a book. I have it. Uh, I haven't started reading. Well, I've started reading a few pages of it. Uh, that is supposed to be the most thorough reckoning of the creation of the Trinity doctrine ever. And later next year, because we've got a whole lot of stuff to plow through before the end of this year. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the Trinity doctrine and where it came from. But it's not biblical. And the Trinitarian will kind of scream black and blue and say, yes, it is. What are you talking about? You can't even be a Christian if you deny the Trinity. Well, that's a good point, because that tells us a little bit about what Christianity actually is. If I have to believe in something that Jesus never taught to be a Christian, 
then Christianity isn't Jesus's faith, religion at all. Can't be. So it's a it's kind of an interesting thing that they say. You know, you'll you'll find a lot of these things in Christianity today. Can't be a Christian if you don't believe the Bible's the word of God. Well, it's not. Jesus is the word of God, right? John 1 1, Revelation 19 13. Um Yahweh is God. Well, wait a minute. We're going we're gonna to look at that just a little bit right here. Can't be a Christian if you don't believe in the Trinity. Why? Right? So things have been made up over time. And you've been born recently in the last hundred years where people for generations have believed in a Trinity like this. Uh, and so you just think, well, that's normal. Of course there's a trinity. What are you talking about? People look at you like you're, like you're an idiot. What do you mean there's no trinity? Of course there's a trinity. It's all through the Bible. Where? You never get an answer to that question. Where? Show me. Show me in the text. Give me a book, a chapter and verse, where I can go see where Jesus taught his disciples about a trinity. You won't find it. It doesn't exist. So this is the traditional Christian view of, of God based on a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, let's take a look at some of the things that I have found because they are markedly different. And I'm guessing a lot of you watching this, this is going to be the very first time you've ever heard any of this stuff. And so it can seem a little out there. But everything I'm about to show you is based upon the Bible, specifically what Jesus said, because that's really what matters to me. What did Jesus say? Right, if you look at my Bible study guide, which helps you to break down a verse in multiple different ways and to ask all kinds of questions and everything, we talk there about the preeminence of Jesus. If Jesus says something, it overrules something else. And even that, some Christians will get really upset about. Well, wait a minute. In, in Matthew chapter 5, four times, Jesus said, You have heard it said in their law, but I tell you something different. All right? What Jesus has to say overrules everything else always has, always will, because he, not your Bible, he is the word of God, the messenger of God, the only one authorized to speak on behalf of his father. That's what word means. This word logos has been so poorly uh, mistranslated these days, and we'll be talking more about the word of God and logos as we start making more videos. Welcome everybody, good to see you here. So we lose people, see I tell the truth and, and people drop off. So let's now take a look at what I think is a kingdom view. And it's important to say this, I'm not starting a cult or a religion. This is research. We want to understand what is true. And that means multiple people coming together and wrestling with the text and pleading with the Holy Spirit to come and fill us because our Lord told us that our primary revelation of him would come from the Holy Spirit, right? I will send another and he will remind you of everything that I have said and taught. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Father, is our primary revelation of God, not a Bible. All right, there's lots of people that are going to be going to heaven that have never even heard of a Bible before because the Spirit of the Father is there to tell everybody, to inform everybody, but church leadership doesn't like that because what happens there is the argument that I've, I've heard many times, like, well, then everyone's going to believe different things. You mean like they do already using the Bible? <laughs> I mean right? So it's not a valid argument. All right, let's look at this. 
this is going to be very unusual if you've not seen anything like this before. Okay, so we're going to look at a kingdom view. Let me switch over here to my uh, full screen mode and I'll disappear here. There we go. Um, you can see far more on your screen. All right. So we're going to look at a kingdom view that is based on Jesus' teachings about Yahweh and ancient sources that discuss the kingdom in detail. And that means we're going to start with the Elohim. And the Elohim is this council of 12. And we're going to look at some of the very top ranked members of the council. So we're going to look here uh, before Yahweh's birth and after Yahweh's birth. Now, some of you might be thinking, what do you mean is Yahweh's birth? Yahweh's God, and he's eternal. He has always existed. That's not what we know. That's what Christianity teaches, yeah. That's what I taught all my life. And I was wrong because I didn't bother looking at evidence. I instead just was an echo chamber for the Christian narrative, which over 2,000 years has become so utterly distorted. Yahweh was born. Jesus was born too. When we see Yahweh in the Old Testament, I have a, a whole study on this, Yahweh the physical God. And you will see there that there are just a multitude of passages in the Old Testament that very clearly show Yahweh was a physical person, a physical person. And there are some people that want to say, oh, you mean when, when he met with Moses face to face? Well, that's one. But what about the other times when Yahweh walked up to a group of people and they were fed and had their feet washed because it was Yahweh and a couple of others with him. And so they ate food, they drank. What about other times when Yahweh was walking with people? Uh, even in the garden, we see that Yahweh's steps in the garden were making sounds, and Adam and Eve hid from the sound of the Lord God walking through the garden in the cool of the evening, right? So there's a lot of passages in the Bible that are very, very important that talk about kind of these foundational things about God that are just ignored. So Yahweh is a physical person. But let's take a look at before Yahweh's birth. The kingdom at that time was at peace. And we have a divine council of 12, the Elohim. And we see ranked number one is the Father. And I just put here, because we did put up here about uh, the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, well, the Holy Spirit is the Father's Spirit. The Holy Father? Well, he has a spirit. What do you think that spirit might be called? The Holy Spirit? Holy Father? has a spirit. It's called the Holy Spirit. That's why it's the unforgivable sin to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Christianity does not have an explanation for that passage in, in the text where it talks about, where Jesus talked about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What? what? What's, where's the Holy Spirit's hardly ever mentioned. Now, all of a sudden, if you say the wrong thing about the Holy Spirit, that's an unforgivable sin. Oh, if it's the Father's Spirit, well, that makes total sense because he's the judge. He's the top. There's nobody above him. And then ranked second in the Elohim Divine Council, we have Jesus, the firstborn son of the Father who sits at the right hand of the Father. But this was before Yahweh's birth. Things change very quickly once Yahweh is born. 
So let's take a look at this. After Yahweh's birth, but before Yahweh tried to overthrow the kingdom, let's expand that and take a closer look. So Yahweh supplants Jesus' rank due to their peculiar legal code. Now, I have explained some of that in other videos, but we'll actually go into that legal code a little bit more in another study because it's kind of quirky and interesting, but we know exactly why. So here, Yahweh has been born, but he hasn't overthrown the kingdom, but he did supplant Jesus' rank. So now Yahweh is ranked second. He is the second-born son, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father, while Jesus is now in third place in the Elohim divine council. By the way, I use this word divine council, and I've used it for a long time, but the English Standard Version, the ESV, if you turn to Psalm 82, where we have the best possible uh, view of this divine council in operation, it actually uses the term divine council. Uh, and if, if people are always telling me, well, you need to read The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. Uh, Michael Heiser was a, he just passed away recently, was a great Hebrew scholar. Uh, he talks about this divine council. He talks about the Elohim being a divine council. What's unusual is he understands that there is this divine council, yet he still taught uh, a trinity. So he still goes back to this trinity idea, yet it's in conflict with uh, this understanding of the divine council. So before Yahweh tried to overthrow the kingdom, the father is still number one. But now Yahweh is number two, and he has taken the Lord's place at the right hand of the Father, and now Jesus is at the left hand of the Father. You think, why does it say specifically in the text about now he's going to go and sit at the right hand of the Father? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. Then Yahweh tries to overthrow the kingdom. Now, of course, as I said, and I, know, I see we've got a few new people turning up here. Uh, if you haven't heard this before, this is going to sound a little zany, a little out there. But from all of my research, this is correct. So now Yahweh tries to overthrow the kingdom. You say, wait, I thought Satan tried to overthrow the kingdom. Bingo, you got it. That's correct. And you might say, wait, no, 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 no. I said, Satan, you're talking about Yahweh. Yes. Uh-huh. But they are the same person. So once Yahweh has tried to overthrow the kingdom, Jesus is now back in second place, still at the left hand of the Father because there are some legal issues that need to take place. And we see those legal issues taking place starting in Revelation chapter 5 and onwards the contract for humanity. And now Yahweh is no longer on the council. Why? Because he's been exiled to earth. He chose to become an adversary, a Hasatan, which in English we say Satan. Then, because he was exiled to earth, he stole the Lord's people from Egypt and made himself God of earth since he could not in heaven. And boy, I, I can't imagine uh, the steam coming out of some people's ears if they're hearing this for the very first time. And I'm sorry that some of the things you've been taught are not biblical. And there's something else going on here. So that's... That was our current state some time ago, 2,000 years ago, was here. 
But now the Lord has come. And now we're in this period of the restoration of all things. So in this situation, we have uh, the Father still, number one. But now Yeshua, Jesus, has been restored both to the second highest rank in the kingdom, but also to the right hand of the Father because Jesus fulfilled Yahweh's law freeing humanity. This is all about the contract for humanity that we find in Revelation chapter 5 and onwards all through the book of Revelation. The scroll with the seven seals, that is a contract for the possession, the ownership of humanity. And I'm not making that up. It says that explicitly. The angels specifically described, they're recorded there in Revelation, explaining that now humanity has changed ownership and now belongs to the Father and the Son. And this is another point where if you think Yahweh is God, if Yahweh is the Father, well, it's telling us in Revelation that possession of humanity has been changed to the Father and Son. Well, how can it change to the Father and Son if, if Yahweh is the Father because he had possession, right? I can't buy my own stuff from myself, right? So now that he's fulfilled Yahweh's law, he is restored to the right hand of the Father, and then we see Yahweh, Satan the adversary, exiled on earth, and now cast out permanently. And we can read in Revelation exactly what happens to him. And then the most wonderful thing of all is that humanity is grafted into the kingdom, removed from earth to live in heaven, physical place. We are resurrected for a reason right? A lot of Christians, because it's basically what Christianity teaches, think that all of the stuff is non-physical, right? That we are going to spend eternity just as spirits in the ether. But that's not the case. We see in the first garden, in Genesis 2 and 3, were the humans' spirits there without physical bodies? No, no one argues that at all. We know there were physical people walking around in a physical garden. And then right at the end of Revelation, we see Jesus walks us to the new garden, where we get to once again freely partake of the fruit of the tree of life. We're not being resurrected to then die or be killed or changed somehow into a non-physical form. It's so popular, both in Christianity, in uh, Gnosticism, Christian Gnosticism, and in almost all New Age and other ideas out there that we're trapped in these horrible physical bodies and we need to get out, that's not what the Bible tells us. John talks about humanity being evacuated from earth in a <laughs> giant cube, this massive transporter. By the way, you're always told you can't take it with you, right? That's not what Revelation tells us. We're going to live here on this planet for about a thousand years while people are resurrected and things are prepared. And then we leave. And it actually does say in Revelation that we get to take stuff with us. Well, again, that means it's physical. Right? What can you take with you if you're, if you're a non-physical entity? Right? 
we've been taught a whole bunch of stuff that just isn't true. And I just want to find out what is true because my love for Jesus is never going to die. When I gave my life to Jesus when I was 11 years of age, within days I was out on the streets of Takapuna in Auckland, New Zealand, witnessing to people, sharing the gospel with people. That was my brand new introduction to a life of ministry. Now, I've never turned my back on him. And sometimes understanding what is true is a bit of a process. Sometimes we need to unlearn so much. The stuff that others have told us and have gotten really mad at us if we don't believe them. Believe in Jesus. Don't believe so much in the ideas that men have come up with over the last 2,000 years or even before that. But instead, believe in Jesus and what he said. At least the best we have it in the Gospels. And a lot of people will say, maybe you're not a, a Christian religious, you don't care about Jesus, you're, someone shared this with you, you're like, I, I, don't, I didn't believe in any of this stuff. The Bible's just made by men. I would challenge you to go through uh, my five questions to learn about Jesus. Actually, we could kind of pull that up right now, I think. Let me see if I can do that because, and we'll just end on this. So stick with me for just a second here. And, um, oh, and thank you to my sponsor. Uh, if you want to financially support me, then you can certainly do that. You can get along to uh, andersondiscoveries.com and you'll find there's a support link there. Or you can go to ialife.com and check out, I eat a lot of meat. I love meat. I eat a fairly close to carnivore diet. And the quality of the meat I eat is really important, but so is the price. And Riverbend Ranch is something completely new. And so I definitely recommend uh, going and, and checking that out. Let me see if I can find something here. Oh, it's on the other screen. Okay, give me a second. I can do this. We'll be okay. Because the five questions that I came up with many, many years ago is such a, a simple way, but a profound way to learn about Jesus, not by going to a church, just by reading the Bible with five questions in mind. And that's them here. So let's see. Let's just shrink this a little bit so you can see it here. Um, these are the five questions. And all you're going to do is use this guide. Uh, I'll drop the image of it below so you'll be able to save it and use it. And basically, you're just going to grab a notebook. You're going to write these five questions down, the five essential questions. What did Jesus say about himself, his father, what he came to do, where he came from, and there's not a ton of information in the Gospels about where he came from, but he does talk about it, and it's important. And what will soon take place, which with everything that's going on right now, you notice the date here, Thursday, October 19, 2023, when war appears to be about to break out on a global basis. Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Hamas, uh, Things aren't looking terribly great right now. Hopefully you're watching this in two years' time and you're and you're just saying out loud, Oh no, that's all been and gone. We didn't that all fizzled out and everybody shook hands and everything's okay. I hope that is the case, but uh things are looking a little dicey right now. Uh these five questions will tell you more about Jesus just by reading through the Gospel of John. Start there in the Gospel of John and read the other Gospels as well. That's the first four books in, in the New Testament that chronicle Jesus' life. And this is where you want to start. Don't have to go to church. Don't have to be, become a religious person. I'm not a religious person. I'm rather anti-religion. Because everything Jesus taught us was 
hey, this is just us. This is friendship, relationship, right? And as you go through the Bible with these five questions and you learn about Jesus from his own lips, at least the best we have it recorded, and you might say the Bible's a load of nonsense, but I guarantee you, when, when you go through these five questions in the Gospel of John, you will get a divine revelation of his love for us. Pieces will start to connect. You'll be able to start to connect the dots and realize there's something here. So don't, maybe I should say, forgive the Christians that might have told you some really strange things about God and Jesus and made excuses for that guy in the Old Testament and how evil he was. 2.4 million murders recorded in the Bible at the hands of Yahweh or people under his direct instruction. Yeah, and, and the Christian wants to say, that's God. I assure you, it's not. That's the adversary. That's the one that tries to steal, kill, and destroy. Not the Father of our Lord. So do this. Go through the five questions. You'll surprise yourself. I'll tell you this. If you go through the five questions with the Gospel of John, you know, you do it in the evenings for about an hour. Take you maybe a week and a half. Won't take you that long. Okay? It's not that large of a book. You'll learn more about Jesus than a four-year seminary student. I assure you, I've been there. I know. <laughs> okay? Uh, seminary is mainly about how to be a good pastor. But in the Bible, with these five questions, you can learn about Jesus and it will really blow your mind. So I'll put this uh, as an image in the chat of this video and uh, you can go through some of the other stuff that's here. There's some recommendations on how to do it, uh, on what Bible translations uh, you might want to use. Um, and then if you want to no more, you can go to my website, andersondiscoveries.com, all right? So thank you for joining me tonight. I hope you'll do this. I really hope you'll do this. Go through the five questions because there's no better way to learn about Jesus than yourself. You can do it. You're totally capable. It's really easy. And you'll be so surprised at what you learn. All right. I'm going to leave it at that for this evening. If someone shared this with you and you're here, you don't really know who I am. Uh, we used to do this all the time a couple of years ago. We took a bit of a break. And this video is kind of our re-entrance into doing this all the time. And I know a lot of my friends are going to be happy about that. So uh, follow me here on Facebook or on Twitter. You can join the Telegram group. You can find all that kind of information at my main website, israelanderson.com. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Okay? You have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you for joining me. And do share this uh, video with somebody that you think might actually get something from it. Have a great night. Bye-bye.